Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Children of Dune by Frank Herbert. Dane reads. So this is the third book in the Dune series. Obviously, this is one that you do have to read in chronological order. It's been a while since I've read the other Dune books, the first two, so I wasn't sure how I'd get on with it. Um, but I am pleased to report that I've been able to understand what's happening and I have been enjoying it. I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts on rating at the end. So, the third in the Dune sequence. The double award winning Dune sequence moves on. For all things must pass, and only change is constant. The sandblasted desert world of Arrakis has become green, watered and fertile. Old Paul Atreides, who led the Fremen to domination of the galaxy, is gone. But for the children of Dune, the very blossoming of their land contains the seeds of its own destruction. As the altered climate threatens extinction to the giant sandworms, fanatics challenge the rule of the Atreides family. And what's cool about this is a lot of the things that I've tapped are actually uh, the little quotes that introduce the different sections, you know? But also, I want to read this. This is uh, the About the Author thing, and I didn't know about this. I know Frank Herbert died relatively young, and quite a long time ago, and it seems he was a bit of a pioneer of alternate energies. So anyway, I'll just read his bio. Frank Herbert was born in 1920. Before taking up writing full-time, he was a professional photographer, journalist, and occasional oyster diver. His colourful and varied career has also included stints as a radio news commentator and jungle survival instructor. His first science fiction novel, The Dragon in the Sea, 1956, was a prescient story of nuclear submarines and is often regarded as prefiguring actual developments in technology. He has written many novels since and now divides his time between a farm in the Pacific Northwest of the USA and a second home in Hawaii. Both homes put into practice his strong beliefs about environmental protection, drawing their energy from solar and wind power. Children of Dune continues the monumental story of Dune. The Atreides family find their domination of Dune is threatened and have to battle with all their might to save their unique and treasured land. Frank Herbert has created a complete planetary ecology with a beautifully drawn cast of characters whose social system reflects the rigours of their water-starved world and he won the highest literary accolades in the SF world, the Nebula and Hugo Awards. The themes of Dune have been explored in the sequels to Children of Dune, God Emperor of Dune, Heretics of Dune, and Chapter House Dune. They have established Frank Herbert as one of the modern masters of science fiction. And so I'll probably be reading some more of the Dune books because basically I'm trying to get through my TBR pile. Um, and as part of that I have one of the, the ones that his son wrote after he passed away. So I need to read all of the original books to get to that point so I can read that book, you know. Let me get this near the start. So Ganema wiped a tear from her right eye. Water for the dead, Leto whispered. And that's just, um, you know, there's a lot of symbology in this about water. Uh, and tears are considered to be like, they're very, you know, when you spill a tear for the dead, water's like, or it used to be anyway, before the, the terraforming of the planet, water was in high demand. So um, it was considered like the ultimate mark of respect. We got some French, oublié je ne puis, I cannot forget. Just seemed weird to have French in June, but I don't, I don't see why not, you know? Alright, so here's one of the quotes that I enjoyed. Uh, we have a lot of these, as I say, at the start of each section. So, Lectures on Prescience by Hark al -Adda. Either we abandon the long-honoured theory of relativity, or we cease to believe that we can engage in continued accurate predictions of the future. Indeed, knowing the future raises a host of questions which cannot be answered under conventional assumptions unless one first projects an observer outside of time and, second, nullifies all movement. If you accept the theory of relativity, it can be shown that time and the observer must stand still in relationship to each other, or inaccuracies will intervene. This would seem to say that it is impossible to engage in accurate prediction of the future. How, then, do we explain the continued seeking after this visionary goal by respected scientists? How, then, do we explain Wadib? And then we get the fear litany, which uh, I actually have the opening line on my arm, fear is the mind killer. So it goes, I must not fear, fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. And I have that on my arm. It's a sort of visual reminder of anxiety, but also the fact that the fear will pass. Uh, this was an interesting line and very true. You've heard of animals chewing off a leg to escape a trap. There's an animal kind of trick. A human would remain in the trap, endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. Another quote here from one of the chapter starts I wanted to share, from the instruction manual, Missionaria Protectiva. These are illusions of popular history which a successful religion must promote. Evil men never prosper, only the brave deserve the fair. Honesty is the best policy, actions speak louder than words, virtue always triumphs, a good deed is its own reward, any bad human can be reformed. Religious talismans protect one from demon possession. Only females understand the ancient mysteries. 
the rich are doomed to unhappiness. And I like this as well just because it's language and I, I nerd out on language. We must escape possession, Leto said. He used the special infinitive of the ancient language, a form strictly neutral in voice and tense, but profoundly active in its implications. And again, another thing interesting about language. We have to do it, he said. If we fail to act, we might just as well fall upon our knives. He used the Fremen form, which carried the meaning of spill our water into the tribal cistern. Again, just underscoring the importance of water to this uh, civilization. Uh, we get a reference to Aneromancy, the science of studying dreams, uh, which is cool because one of my uh, clients has that in his uh, fantasy novel. And so it's just nice to see that out in the wild and like, you know, being used by another writer. It's kind of cool to combine how Frank Herbert did it with how my client did it. I like this, this little line here. Very well, he sighed. First, that's the time. There is no difference between 10,000 years and one year. No difference between 100,000 years and a heartbeat. No difference. That is the first fact about time. And the second fact, the entire universe with all of its time is within me. Quote here from the Apocrypha of Muad'Dib. Atrocity is recognised as such by victim and perpetrator alike, by all who learn about it at whatever remove. Atrocity has no excuses, no mitigating argument. Atrocity never balances or rectifies the past. Atrocity merely arms the future for more atrocity. It is self-perpetuating upon itself, a barbarous form of incest. Whoever commits atrocity also commits those future atrocities thus bred. We could do with remembering that now. Another line here which eerily relevant, <laughs> I guess. Um, Although whether you agree with it is different, but it certainly reflects what we see happening. Change is dangerous, Stilgar told himself. Sameness and stability were the proper goals of government. I thought this was cool as well, so this is talking about some of the art of Dune. They sell pieces of etched marble, he said, pointing. Did you know that? They set the pieces out in the desert to be etched by storm sands. Sometimes they find interesting patterns in the stone. They call it a new art form, very popular. Genuine storm etched marble from Dune. I bought a piece of it last week, a golden tree with five tassels. Lovely, but very fragile. I'd have some of that. And then there's a Bene Gesserit saying, which I appreciate as an anxiety slash death anxiety sufferer. To suspect your own mortality is to know the beginning of terror. To learn irrefutably that you are mortal is to know the end of terror. Now, I don't know about that because I know irrefutably that I am mortal and it terrifies me. It's interesting reading that from a dead guy as well. Okay, this quote from the commentaries, this is about uh, Muad'Dib. It is said of Muad'Dib that once when he saw a weed trying to grow between two rocks, he moved one of the rocks. Later, when the weed was seen to be flourishing, he covered it with the remaining rock. That was its fate, he explained. It's very, like, guru-y, isn't it? And so we get this again. This is just a great illustration of how water is treated by this society. Once more, Faradin thought about those report spools. They told of a disquieting thing, the persistence of a cultural remnant from the most ancient Fremen times, the water of conception. The amniotic fluid of the newborn was saved at birth, distilled into the first water fed to that child. The traditional form required a godmother to serve the water, saying, here is the water of thy conception. Even the young Fremen still followed this tradition with their own newborn. The water of thy conception. Faradin found himself revolted by the idea of drinking water distilled from the amniotic fluid which had borne him, and the thought about the surviving twin, Ganima, her mother dead when she'd taken that strange water. Has she reflected later upon that odd link with her past? Probably not. She'd been raised Fremen. What was natural and acceptable to Fremen had been natural and acceptable to her. Okay, another great quote here from the Asbar book. Shamra one, I4, 1, 4. The one-eyed view of our universe says you must not look far afield for problems. Such problems may never arrive. Instead, tend to the wolf within your fences. The packs ranging outside might not even exist. And another example of the like reverence for water here. You're not wearing a still suit, Ganema said. Did you know that in the old days, someone caught outside the sitch without a still suit was automatically killed? To waste water was to endanger the tribe. But obviously now, water is everywhere, it's flourishing. So I think it does a really good job of, again, just this theme of the water and looking at how the water on uh, June changes the society and what happens when you get this clash between old and new. There's a lot of great stuff in here that you can kind of extrapolate and relate back to our own world as well. I found it really enjoyable to read, so I gave this one a pretty solid four out of five and will be continuing with the June series. So there we have it, that's what I made of Children of June. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.